Welcome to the recorded version of Loss of Independence and Isolation, part of the Family Caregiver Support Webinar Series brought to you by the American Society in Aging and a generous sponsorship from Home Instead Senior Care. Okay, our presenter today is Lakeland Hogan. Lakeland is a gerontologist and caregiver advocate for Home Instead Senior Care. She works to educate professionals, families, and communities on issues older adults face. Lakeland is a doctoral candidate at the University of Nebraska Omaha, where she is studying social gerontology. She has a Master of Arts in Social Gerontology and a Master's in Business Administration from UNO. Lakeland has professional experience in the private and public sectors of senior care services. She has worked on special projects for UNO's Department of Gerontology and the Local Area Agency on Aging. Lakeland serves as Vice President of the Board of Directors for the Dreamweaver Foundation and is active in the Alzheimer's Association's Walk to End Alzheimer's. Lakeland has a passion for helping others, especially aging adults and their families. And with that, I would like to welcome our presenter for today, Lakeland Hogan. Thanks for being here, Lakeland. Thank you so much, Steve. Hello, everyone. I can't believe that it's already our last webinar of 28, or 2017. Uh, this year has certainly flown by, and I know the holiday season is a hectic time, so I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to tune in to today's webinar. Uh, we're going to be focusing on the loss of independence and isolation. And today's topic is really a sensitive yet important topic to, uh, to discuss. Coping with the changes that aging can bring is tough for many older adults, even though it's usually a gradual change. But losing independence is one of the toughest changes to cope with uh, when you think about the aging process as a whole. If we pause to think about it, independence is something that humans strive for from a very young age, from taking our first steps to driving for the first time, moving out of the house after our teenage years. We really spend many of our younger years longing for independence, and then we get used to that independence and the ability to control certain aspects of our lives. So as people age, they fear losing the ability to do things on their own and can have difficulties accepting a loss of independence, which is certainly understandable. But there's also a risk of isolation that comes along with age and a loss of independence. So today we're going to dive, dive deeper into kind of all of these different aspects. And as professionals in the aging field, we can help families better understand what their older adult loved one is going through and then help them find solutions to maintain their independence uh, and to prevent that, that isolation that so many older adults are facing. So let's kick things off by going over the objectives for today. I want to start by discussing the importance of independence to older adults and then some easily identifiable signs that we can educate caregivers on to look for in their loved ones, uh, especially when these, these changes of um, independence changes in their independence that are coming about as they age. And they really fall into three different categories that we'll talk about. There's the physical and emotional changes that occur. There's changes in the attentiveness, and I'll talk more about what that means. And then there's going to be some environmental cues that we can tell caregivers to be on the lookout for. And I've already mentioned that these changes are difficult to cope with, so we're going to dive deeper into the common fears that are related to aging. We're also going to talk about ways to help older adults cope with this loss of independence, and then we'll switch gears a little bit to focus more on the impact of isolation in older adults and discover tips and resources to help older adults avoid isolation. So let's, without further ado, uh, revisit the conversation about independence and why that's so important to older adults. Well, for older adults, home is a very significant part of their independence. It's a place where they feel most comfortable, they feel safe, and they have memories of family and friends. And it's a place we want them to be because it's where they're most comfortable. And it's no surprise that nearly 90% of older adults want to stay at home as they age. Moving out of the home uh, for many is a loss of independence, uh, and they may become fearful of that. They may also want to maintain their current lifestyle and control. That's why they're afraid of this loss of independence. And they also want to avoid becoming a burden to their families. And, you know, they, they want to avoid this so much so that they may deny their true care needs to keep that independence longer. Or they might be afraid to admit those care needs for fear that uh, admitting they need help 
uh, will cause their family or loved ones to go to extreme me measures of moving them out of their home or moving them into a facility, taking away their keys, that sort of thing. So older adults often hold back their, their true needs for help and assistance to preserve their, their independence. So that's why it's important, again, for older adults uh, and others caring for older adults, or pardon me, adult children or others caring for older adults to look for the warning signs that their aging loved one might need a little extra help. Because if we're ignoring these warning signs, it will likely lead to the kind of dependence that they're trying to avoid. Um, and it also can help avoid a crisis situation. So often we see uh, older adults fall or be hospitalized for various reasons that really could have been prevented. Uh, probably if families looked back and reflected, hindsight's always 2020. There are probably some of these signs uh, that the family had missed or chose to uh, delay addressing, which of course we want to be more proactive when working with families uh, and older adults to really, one, keep help the older adult keep their independence as long as possible, and two, to make sure that when we are finding solutions, we're keeping the older adult's wishes um, in mind. And families might be wondering, are there certain causes of loss of independence? What, what are some of the triggers? And we do know that a lot of times, changes in an older adult's independence can be the result of major life events. So let's talk more about that. For many older adults, there are perks to getting older, such as retirement, uh, more time for leisure activities, time to spend with family and friends. Uh, however, there's also bound to be some major life changes that occur that really impact their independence as they age. For starters, they might begin to have changes in their social networks. They might begin to lose family members or friends, and this can impact people's um, support network that can help, help them. Um, and when they start to become dependent on others, um, if their social circles or social networks are shrinking, they have less people to help support them. And this is especially true when two older adults are living together in the same home. They really end up compensating for one another's loss of independence. So uh, just to give you an example, if a husband and wife are living together, and if the wife passes away, the family might start to notice that the wife was really compensating for the husband's loss of independence. And once she passed, he really wasn't able to function alone and needed assistance. So that major life change of losing his wife really impacted his social network, um, and then the family had to really step in and help support him in other ways. So again, those changes in the social network uh, can really impact the ind person's independence. They might also be experiencing changes in their social roles. Uh, a big one that a lot of older adults experience is going from employment to retirement. Uh, maybe they are taking on caregiving roles themselves, maybe for a spouse or another older adult relative, such as a cousin. Um, they might also start to rely more on their adult children for assistance, which can definitely be a change in their social role. They used to be the, um, the caretaker, but now they're relying on their children to take care of them. So it's a difficult adjustment and transition to, um, to take on as they're losing their independence. And then they're also likely to have changes in their physical health, which could limit their independence. For example, poor eyesight might prevent them from driving. Arthritic hands might make cooking more more difficult. A fall or morbidity issue could prevent them from engaging in activities they once loved, such as golf or tennis or getting out to different social settings. And then mental health issues can also arise. Depression um, can result as a lot result from a loss of independence uh, and functional ability. And then there also might be some cognitive issues that could impact their ability to care for themselves. So again, these major life changes can really impact the loss of independence and how they cope with that loss. So when it comes to the older adult themselves, how do they react to these various losses? Well, everyone's situation is very different, as we all know, um, and therefore the adults, uh, older adult's method of coping might differ, but there are some central feelings and central questions that come up. When an older person starts to lose their abilities and independence, they may start to ask themselves, will my life lose meaning if I'm no longer useful? 
people want to feel validated. They want to feel useful and that they're still contributing to the world. So as they're losing these uh, independence, losing the abilities to do things for themselves, uh, families might want to think about new ways that they can still contribute and make a difference in the world. They might also wonder, um, when will I lose my mental abilities or physical abilities? So often older adults are fearful of cognitive decline or cognitive impairment. So they might uh, be, these feelings might be kind of boiling to the surface as they think about losing uh, some of their abilities. And they might think, when I do lose my independence in certain areas, who will I rely on for help? People sometimes fear being weak or needy, and we talked about earlier, we're raised to be independent human beings. Uh, our parents raised us to you know, fly from the nest and be independent and prosper. Uh, so this, this concept of um, reaching out to others for help really goes against the grain, kind of goes against what we were brought up, uh, in how we were brought up in terms of being independent. So with all of these questions and uncertainties, fear is certainly likely to surface. Uh, some people, again, might be frightened by new vulnerabilities, wondering how they'll manage on their own. This might be also overwhelming, and they might begin to expect more out of their social network, out of their friends and families. And this can also uh, put um, some stressful situations on the family caregiver. It might be difficult for family caregivers to, to manage uh, all of these new responsibilities. So we need to keep that in mind. Another feeling that older adults might experience is anger. Feeling angry that they can no longer manage on their own is very common. I saw this happen in my own grandfather. He just had a knee surgery or knee procedure. And um, while he was able to recover pretty much back to full functional mobility, he was very frustrated in the moment that he had to rely on other people for help. So that feeling of anger, even if it's just temporary, you know, during a time of recovery, can, is, is one that really uh, can affect an older adult. And they might, you know, in these times come across as stubborn or being difficult, uh, but we need to keep in mind, you know, what is the root of that stubbornness or difficult? Maybe it is because they're angry about uh, losing this independence that they've clung to you know, most of their life. And then some might be feeling guilty. Uh, they might refuse help from family or friends because they think that they will be a burden. They don't uh, want to burden their children or their loved ones, their social network, um, so then they just don't reach out. And finally, they might be experiencing confusion. It's not uncommon for people to feel confused about needing help. They might be confused about what's happening to them, why they're unable to do things they will, uh, why they aren't able to do things they were once able to do. Uh, so when we're working with family caregivers and older adults, we can help them identify these different feelings, and then again get to that root cause of the feeling, uh, and then we can help find solutions and address ways to help them remain independent and help them continue to engage in the activities, uh, those independent activities that they once uh, did for themselves. And we can encourage them, uh, family caregivers, to kind of step into the older adult's shoes and look at it from their, their point of view to get a better understanding of the situation, help them empathize with their loved one. Um, and while we're kind of talking about the things that family caregivers can do and say, uh, we have some additional suggestions here on the next slide. Families can remind their loved one that these feelings are normal. They're normal responses to the situation, and there are other people out there that are also losing their abilities and struggling with it, so they're not alone. And sometimes if they feel that they're in the same boat as others, then it can provide some comfort to them. Families also can encourage their loved one to really take each day one day at a time, one change at a time. It's typical to think far down the future, oh, I can't do this now, what else am I going to lose? We can in instead help them to really live in the moment and embrace uh, their abilities at the current time. And you know we can all be negative at times, so again, encouraging that positive attitude really goes a long way. And there are some positive things that come along with aging. Uh, older adults have so much wisdom and experience, uh, and they can share that with one another. Uh, they can reminisce on positive memories, and they can still contribute to the world. It just might have to be in a different way. And families can really help their loved ones stay positive uh, and find those new ways to contribute. 
Another good tip to share is to encourage, encourage the older adult not to compare themselves uh, to how things once were uh, when it comes to their abilities. It's really hard to do, but it can be helpful for older adults when reacting to these various losses. Help them stay focused on what they can do um, and what their abilities allow them to do. And as I mentioned earlier, um, sometimes these older adults we're working with might not admit that they need help or that they're experiencing these various losses of independence, but there are certainly signs that family caregivers can watch out for. And so we're going to start to review those various signs. We're going to start with the physical signs. And you know, this is really a great time of year to be talking with families about the signs that their loved one is needing some additional support because with the holidays, people are visiting older relatives, they're spending extended amounts of time with them. However, families should be a little aware that uh, at times of family gatherings or holidays, sometimes older adults will really put their best foot forward because they don't want to um, have their adult children and family members noticing these shortcomings or these losses of independence. So just something to keep in mind. But most importantly, when we talk to families about these signs, um, we want to do so because it's important to recognize them early on. Doing so will allow them to get their loved one the needed support to either prevent further loss of independence further loss of independence, or avoid a crisis situation, which so often as professionals in these fields, families come to us after there's already been a crisis. So if we can be proactive, we can, again, help them to maintain this sense of independence and, again, keep the older adult's wishes at the forefront, talk with them about their options, and that sort of thing. So uh, without further ado, let's talk about the physical signs. Um, so. One uh, would be a loss of energy. Does the older adult seem tired all of the time? Uh, when they call um, their loved one, are they just waking up from a nap? Um, or have they really slept in until 10 a.m. and this is, you know, the, um, they're just now getting up for the day? Persistent fatigue and loss of energy are two physical signs that they might be struggling and they might need some additional attention or extra support. We can also advise family caregivers that when visiting an older adult loved one, they should take note if they have difficulty getting up or are unsteady when standing. Uh, so if we're seeing these balance issues, changes in gait, um, especially when they're walking from room to room, or if you're seeing them really use uh, the arm of the couch to get up, or if they're holding on to furniture as they walk throughout the room, uh, those are some signs that they may need an assistive walking device, which could, again, help them navigate the home more safely. Another key area to look for in this area of balance issues, changes in gait, mobility, um, really is the bathroom. Because we so often see those towel bars uh, and the shower curtain, the windowsill. Um, another uh, good one to look out for is if the if there's a cupboard that opens up right next to the toilet. Has the loved one been trying to use those things, the towel bar, that cupboard door, uh, the windowsill, to get themselves up out of the shower or the tub, off the toilet, that sort of thing. So again, these are some signs that we can tell the family caregivers about to be on the lookout for. Other physical symptoms of underlying health issues could be a loss of appetite or lo uh, so extreme weight loss. If you're hearing the words a lot, oh, I'm not hungry, uh, and you're hearing that more and more often, um, it might be a sign that something's going on. So caregivers can check over the grocery list, uh, can take a peek in the, the cupboards. You know, is there a lot of junk food, easily prepared foods that are full of sodium, that sort of thing? Are they lacking nutritional value? Uh, those are, again, some signs that they can look out for that uh, their loved one might be at risk of improper nutrition. And again, these can lead to more serious health issues. So continue uh, each time they visit to check the refrigerator, cupboards, those sorts of things to uh, check for signs of poor nutrition. <clears throat> Pardon me. And then also hearing loss. Are family caregivers noticing <coughs> Pardon me. that mom or dad is asking uh, them to repeat things over and over? or speak up a little louder, is the TV volume always so loud? I worked with a client once, uh, her name was Ethel, and when I called her, 
she would answer the phone, hello, and then she would say, wait a minute, I have to turn my TV down before we could ever start our conversation. And that was a clue to me that she was forgetting to wear her hearing aids. So uh, again, families can look out for these small um, small signs that really could be indicating that there is a bigger issue such as hearing or uh, vision even. So when it comes to vision, it's important that older adults are getting regular eye exams because as they age, they're likely um, to develop possibly some eye issues or their eyesight might continue to decline. So they might need to be getting updated prescriptions uh, for, their, for their eyewear more regularly. So if, you're, you know, if families are noticing that their loved one's using a magnifying glass more often to do the word search, that sort of thing, again, might be a sign that there's a vision issue. Uh, but there's also, in addition to these physical signs, there are some emotional signs. So we're going to talk about that next. Recognizing the emotional signs of aging might be apparent. Um, they might not. Uh, and then some signs might even be able to uh, be picked up over the phone, over a phone conversation. So when family caregivers are talking to their loved one, they can ask how they're feeling, uh, talk to them about are you engaging in your usual social activities? So if you know that they attend a rotary club every week or a Bible study or a quilting club, uh, they always get together with, with the guys for breakfast um, once a week, ask them, did you go to that this week? Um, how are the guys or how was the quilting session? These, and if you notice that they're saying, um, oh, I didn't go this week, and you're noticing that pattern, there might be an underlying issue. Um, it could be that maybe they're losing their independence, they don't quite feel safe driving there anymore to that activity, or perhaps uh, they had a friend that would pick them up on the way and that individual is no longer available uh, to take them so they just don't attend, or maybe the environment of that social engagement um, is more challenging for them, perhaps you know, there are some the stairs that they can't navigate on their own, but maybe a, a cane would help them. Or perhaps they're, they're noticing some cognitive changes in themselves, and they don't want to be around their, their friends, their peers, for fear that they'll notice those cognitive declines. So um, again, a loss of interest in socialization can really be um, a, an indicator that there might be something underlying. And again, I, I mentioned that fatigue earlier. Um, if they're they're taking lots of naps, they're not getting up at a regular time, or um, and that sort of thing. Again, some emotional signs might be um, the underlying factor. And sometimes uh, the signal that, that family members might get from their loved one could be very drastic, such as mood changes or the, their outlook on life. So you can ask um, the older adult if they ever go from extreme feelings of happiness to, to sadness, or um, you can keep an eye out, is the individual more irritable and grumpy than normal? And as we know, uh, caregivers should not ignore these signs. And in fact, they could keep an eye out, they should keep an eye out uh, to see if they persist over a stretch of days or weeks. And the caregiver also might want to check with other people that are involved in that person's life, other family members, friends, neighbors, to see if they're noticing some of these behavioral changes too. Um, sometimes um, if multiple people are noticing these changes, then again, likely to be an underlying issue. Another thing that we can look out for is attentiveness. Uh, and attentiveness signals and environmental clues. So let's talk more about that. Over time, uh, an older adult might not be as attentive to various aspects of their lives that may be indicating that support is needed. So when it comes, with, when it, uh, when it comes to the older adult's appearance, perhaps the older adult has historically always been a sharp dresser, always put together, uh, but now their clothing is a little more wrinkled. There's more spots and spills on the shirt or pants than ever before. This could be a sign that they're uh, being less attentive to their appearance. They might uh, be having issues keeping up with their personal hygiene, their laundry, putting outfits together. Um, it might also be an indicator that they're having issues keeping up uh, with bathing, grooming, that sort of thing. Um, and it could be due to the fact that they don't feel safe bathing or grooming themselves um, 
alone falls. Again, we've talked about how falls can be so detrimental um, to an older adult, so they might be fearful of taking a shower uh, and could just use some extra support. So again, families should be attentive to the person's appearance, uh, and if they're seeing changes, it could be a sign that additional assistance is needed. When it comes to driving, um, family caregivers, it might be a good idea for them to go for a ride with their loved one to look for signs of diminished uh, driving skills, slow response times, rolling through stop signs, that sort of thing. Other warning signs might be missed, turned, missed turns pardon me, from not being able to read the signs or braking quickly to, avoiding, to avoid rear-ending someone. And then families can always do kind of a check around the car uh, for dents, scratches, that sort of thing, and ask the individual, you know, what happened here to see what their response is. So families should be attentive to the driving habits of their older adult loved one because oftentimes that can be an indicator that there's something else underlying. Maybe it's a cognitive issue, a vision issue, that sort of thing. And then finally, um, the area of concentration. Family members should be attentive to that, that area as well. Are they having difficulty concentrating? Um, are they mishandling their medications? Uh, they, family members can carefully examine prescription bottles, check for the refill dates, the number of pills in the bottle to determine are they taking them uh, regularly. Um, caregivers can also call the pharmacy to check whether refills are being ordered at the right time. Uh, you know, an underlying medication issue could be um, a factor that there's something else wrong. Or are they missing appointments, missing their favorite TV show, card games, uh, time spent with friends, that sort of thing. Again, this could be signs of diminishing concentration or memory loss, forgetfulness, confusion, those sorts of things. So, um, Again, if families can be attentive to these different areas when they're interacting with their loved one, it really can be an indicator that something underlying is happening. Maybe they need some extra support. And then uh, before we um, talk about ways families can take action, there is one more set of uh, clues or uh, tips for family caregivers, and, and it really revolves around the environment that the older adult is living in. So we can advise uh, family members, family caregivers, that the next time they visit their loved one to really take a good look around. Um, we've talked about some of this already, but uh, you know, what is the condition of the home? If, if the person always kept a very neat and tidy house and now there's poor housekeeping habits, it could be a sign that they don't have the energy to clean anymore or maybe their mobility issues or vision impairment is really keeping them from uh, keeping up with the house that they were once able to do. They could look for uh, signs in the refrigerator, freezer, drawers, uh, making sure that there's not extra expired food, are there dirty dishes on the countertop? Uh, all sorts of little um, tips and clues that we can look out for throughout the house. When it comes to uh, the floors and the stairwells, are there proper uh, handrails? Has a loved one been uh, spilling things more on the carpet or on the floors? That sort of thing. Again, these can be signs that there's something underlying, something happening um, with the older with the older adults' independence, their abilities uh, to take care of their environment. Uh, so that could be a clue that the family members need to uh, come together and figure out a solution on how that individual can remain in the environment with some added supports. So when it comes to taking action, uh, there are some uh, tips we can share with family members. The first uh, tip or first step is to ensure that the parent's well-being um, is really at the forefront. And to do so, we want to share our concerns with the older adult. We can talk openly and honest, honestly with them. Uh, consider including other people who care about the loved one in the conversation. And remind uh, the caregivers that you work with that this is a conversation, meaning that both parties need a chance to talk openly. And when we talk with our older adult loved one, the tone and approach is really key. We don't want the person to feel attacked. So bringing up one concern at a time might be a good idea as opposed to 
you know, spouting out multiple concerns all at once. The older adult, again, might feel attacked, um, and they might shut down. So if we're able to talk openly, talk positively about the situation, remind them we have the best interests of the older adult in mind. We want them to remain in their environment, to remain independent. And so that's why we're having these conversations and sharing these concerns. Uh, the caregiver also might want to encourage their older adult loved one to schedule a medical checkup, especially if they've noticed some of the physical warning signs such as weight loss or depression. It's also important that the caregiver asks about the follow-up visit. Perhaps they can even go along uh, if the older adult's willing. Um, and then maybe it's time to do a medication review, making sure that the older adult's medications are being taken properly. Is there um, a good system put in place for that uh, and it, keep the, the physician up to date on the medication management as well. And then if the caregiver found safety issues, um, it is a good idea to address these kind of issues with a two-pronged approach. First is to really point out the safety issues and then secondly, making a plan to address them. So the changes really could be as simple as installing better lighting or removing rugs or potential hazards. The caregiver might also consider installing a grab bar in the bathroom, again, to prevent the older adult from hanging on to that towel bar. Uh, to, again, make the situation safer for the older adult, help them maintain their independence. And then if the older adult um, maybe is having uh, issues driving can no longer drive for themselves or maybe having trouble with their personal care or grooming, uh, can't get to the store, those types of things, families could consider other community-based resources. Uh, one of them could be you know, home care, having somebody come in to do those simple tasks, or uh, reaching out to the local area agency on aging to see if they have any um, types of services that could come into the home and help with these things on a day-to-day -day basis. It really can go a long way in helping them, again, to remain independent. And um, if, the, if the older adult really is um, you know, resistant to these types of conversations, uh, the caregiver shouldn't be discouraged. Um, again, these older adults are dealing with the emotions of losing these independents. They don't want to feel that they're a burden to their family members, but we need to encourage them that um, while they may feel like they're losing their sense of control, the family members are really help, trying to help them maintain their sense of control. So when you're talking through these different safety plans or community resource options, involve the older adult if possible. Give them options. Let them sit in on the interview with the home care company. Ask questions. If you can engage them in the solution, they're more likely to um, be accepting of that solution. So um, when it comes to encouraging this sense of choice and control, there's uh, a few more tips in addition to the ones that I've, I've mentioned. But what it boils down to is, the dignity of the, of the individual. We want to maintain the respect and dignity for the older adult that we're working for. We want to treat them as e unequal and ensure, again, that we're trying to help them remain in control of what happens to them. And we're trying to do it more so in a proactive manner. So again, make sure that they're involved in the decision making. Give them an opportunity to participate as fully as they can. Uh, Provide opportunities um, for the older adult to talk about what they think their needs are um, and really help them to determine uh, you know, what needs do they feel need, uh, need to be addressed kind of most importantly or first. And then um, also encourage families to look at this more as a partnership with the older adult. Um, whether when it's a partnership or both sides are feeling uh, that they're wanting success, again, it will go a long way in helping that older adult to adopt solutions. Um, and then one other mantra I want to keep, uh, want families to keep in mind when it comes to this whole idea of choice and control is that we want to um, think of helping our older adult loved one as doing with instead of doing for. So we want 
Uh, again, for older adults to be doing as much as they can on their own. We want to be doing activities with them. So if it's bathing or uh, helping with assistance with grooming or uh, that sort of thing, encourage the older adult to help out as much as possible. Because if, if we're encouraging them uh, to engage, um, then again, they're going to be more likely to buy in. And so when, when we're going through this whole process and we're, we're talking about helping older adults um, through this loss of independence, sometimes it's helpful to offer family caregivers some, some tips on helping their loved one cope with these different losses. So first things first is uh, to encourage families to remain patient. Uh, sometimes it might, it might take several conversations to get the older adult to come around to the idea of some extra support and some extra help. And then uh, self-acceptance, self recognizing that losing independence is, is a common experience. We want uh, them not to see it as a sign of personal failure. It's completely normal and natural. We need to help family members convey that message to their older adult loved one. And again, as the person ages, the goal of everyone involved uh, needs to be that we're helping the older adult maintain their independence for as long as possible. And then I mentioned this earlier, but we want to allow our older adult loved ones and even the caregivers to feel sad and frustrated at times without putting themselves down for maybe not being able to do something that the older adult was able to do or um, not feeling bad for the adult daughter caregiver who's really grieving the loss of her, her parents' independence. Um, so there's a lot of emotions and feelings involved in this whole coping with loss and independence topic. Um, so um, we want to, again, make sure that families are recognizing these feelings uh, and sometimes even just saying things like, this must be really hard for you or um, I know that this is difficult, but together we're going to get through this, can really just be reassuring. And then it's important to remain open. Again, this is a process that might take some time um, and some, some understanding that needs to be reached. Uh, and family members, if they can convey that, you know, this is really from the heart. Um, they're trying to be open to different possibilities, open to different solutions that work best for the loved one because at the end of the day, uh, we just want the older adult to be safe, healthy, uh, and independent as long as they can. So I know we've talked a lot about this coping with loss and independence, um, and this topic actually uh, segues really nicely into the, the conversation of isolation because as older adults are losing their independence, it really does put them at risk of isolation. So well, let's dive deeper into that topic. Losing the ability to drive or do things for yourself uh, as an older adult can really increase the risk of isolation, as I just mentioned. So a lot of times we hear the term isolation and loneliness used interchangeably when we talk about this topic, so I did want to make a clear distinction between the two. Social isolation arises uh, in situations where a person does not have enough people to interact with, and it's really an objective state. Um, and loneliness, on the other hand, uh, is more subjective objective experience over distress of not having enough social relationships or not enough social contact or interactions with people. And although the two concepts can be related, a person can be socially isolated, but they might not feel lonely. Whereas an individual that might have a, a seemingly large social network can still feel loneliness from time to time. So loneliness um, and isolation, while sometimes they're used interchange interchangeably or they might happen simultaneously, uh, they're not always the same thing. Um, and these two should not be mistaken for depression. Uh, it's kind of a separate topic in and of itself, but they oftentimes are correlated. But there are certain risk factors that put older adults at risk for isolation. So let's talk a little more about that. And of course, we all know probably the most obvious one is when an older adult is living alone, especially if they have a small social network um, or, and are living at home. Mobility issues can also put an older adult at risk for isolation um, and also sensory impairment. Um, 
mobility issues and sensory impairment um, might prevent them from being able to drive or get out of the home easily. Sensory impairments such as hearing loss or poor eyesight, uh, again, can put them at risk for isolation. Um, again, preventing them from being able to get out and about, um, preventing them from engaging um, in various activities that might help them feel more socially connected. We talked about this already, but those major life transitions can put someone, someone at risk for isolation, such as uh, the loss of a spouse or a family member that the person really relied on. Um, I know a lot of uh, the greatest generation, the females, didn't even learn to drive because their husband or their spouse provided all of their transportation. So if that loved one is no longer uh, around or able to provide that transportation, it might really put them at risk for isolation. Also, socioeconomic status, uh, lower income older adults or uh, older adults with limited resources are at risk. And actually, being a caregiver for someone with a severe impairment or being a caregiver of an older adult can put someone at risk for isolation. So as we're talking with family caregivers about older adult isolation, we also need to keep in mind that these caregivers themselves might feel isolated too. Uh, they, because of their caregiving duties, uh, they might experience that isolation. They're not able to get out of the home because they feel they have to be there around the clock 24-7 to provide care for their loved one. And then, of course, the uh, psychological and cognitive vulnerabilities, uh, those with dementia and Alzheimer's, and the way it affects their brain can really affect their independence and their ability to get around safely. So again, putting them at risk for isolation. And the location where the older adult lives, that can be a huge factor in isolation, especially for older adults that are in more rural areas or in unsafe or inaccessible neighborhoods or communities. Even though an uh, older adult lives in an urban setting, they might not have access to transportation. I know even in my own community, we do have um, a handicap accessible transportation system, but it only goes about halfway through our city. So it doesn't even reach the, the far western part of our city where some of our big medical um, facilities are. So again, there are some um, issues even within an urban setting when it comes to that sense of isolation. They might also be isolated again due to that smaller social net network or inadequate social support. And then language, that's one that might not always come to mind right away, but language, especially for non-English speaking older adults, they really can be at risk for isolation. A lot of the social services here in the U.S. especially um, are, are just now kind of coming around to the fact that they need to be bilingual and need to have uh, services that are available to those who don't speak English as well. So again, these are all uh, reasons that an older adult might be at risk for isolation. So we just need to keep these things in mind and make family caregivers aware of these risks. And the reason that uh, these risks uh, are so important to be on the lookout for is isolation can really be detrimental to the health of the older adult. And there are both physical and mental health risks. So when it comes to the physical risks, um, we know from research that those who are isolated really have a higher rate of mortality. Uh, they're also more likely to develop health issues such as heart disease or high blood pressure. There's also a higher rate of rehospitalization and falls due to isolation. Uh, and if you think about it, um, if somebody is isolated and alone, if they don't have someone encouraging them to eat healthy or to take their medication or to use their uh, mobility assistive devices, then they are probably at higher risk for all of these things. But if we're able to detect socialization earlier on and provide the older adult with some supports, we can really minimize these risks for physical health. And we also need to keep in mind that social isolation is not always routinely assessed in the primary care setting, uh, and a lot of times it goes undetected. So uh, we, again, need to make family caregivers more aware of this. And then I mentioned that there are some mental health risks associated with isolation. 
And research, again, shows that isolation uh, can put older adults at risk for cognitive decline and even dementia, um, and it can increase the rates of depression and even suicide in older adults. So uh, if we're working with family caregivers and they're really questioning, you know, is my loved one isolated? Are they at risk for isolation? isolation, um, these are some risk factors that they can keep in mind. And then there are also a few questions that we can ask the older adults that we work with to kind of get a quick snapshot um, as to whether the older adult themselves feels that they are isolated. So these following questions can really be used to probe for potential social isolation and loneliness uh, when you're asking about family, friends, recent losses. And so there are three questions that you can use, um, and there's research out there that's used this really to assess kind of that loneliness isolation issue. So first is how often do you feel that you lack companionship? How often do you feel left out? And how often do you feel isolated from others? So uh, this can really, again, give the family a snapshot, a view into their world as to um, their sense of social, uh, social isolation. And then once we're able to understand uh, you know, maybe the cause of their isolation and the extent, we can help families look for solutions and ways to reduce social isolation. And of course, um, the first one is going to be increasing the social network size of the individual. If we can help connect that older adult to families, friends, neighbors, faith communities, perhaps even paid caregivers, paid help in the home, these individuals can help to provide social inter interactions, social supports to that individual. And then we want to work to improve the quality of supports and resources for that older adult or the caregiver that's caring for the older adult. Because as I mentioned earlier, caregivers themselves can suffer from isolation because of their caregiving responsibilities. So they might also need respite or time away or some additional social, uh, social supports uh, or community resources to feel less isolated uh, and really help them provide better care for their loved ones. So we need to make sure that there are aware of programs available. Uh, a lot of communities have active living programs, adult, uh, adults or senior centers, uh, faith-based gatherings. Uh, you could also, again, hire services to come into the home, um, such as home care services like Home Instead, uh, that really schedules regular visits for support, isolation, maybe even provides that uh, transportation that's due to lack of mobility. And if that lack of mobility is really a key, isoliz or key factor in the isolation, if families are kind of getting to the root cause and they've, they've realized, well, ever since we had to take mom or dad's car away from them, they've really become more isolated. Well, there's some community supports out there that really can assist uh, with getting that individual to uh, various activities. So um, there a lot of times are uh, senior centers that have a transportation service. Uh, maybe there are family members or friends, neighbors. Uh, maybe there is somebody that's already going to that social event that could swing by and pick up the older adult loved one on the way. Uh, and with the age of technology, Uber and Lyft are becoming more common ways uh, for older adults to get to and from various activities or appointments. And then again, you could hire a service, a home care company, to come in to provide that transportation. Or like I mentioned in my community, there is a handicap accessible transportation service that is available to older adults. So uh, your local area agency on aging is usually a great resource uh, to look to when um, trying to find um, supports for reducing that sense of isolation. And one key factor for some um, older adults is hearing loss. That can really um, be isolating. Even if they're in a room full of people, if they can't hear the, um, the conversation, if they can't answer the phone because they can't hear who's on the other end, it uh, can really be isolating for the older adults. So we can connect them um, with companies that provide assistive hearing devices such as hearing aids or a special phone such as Caption Call, which is a free phone out there that really types out what is being said over the phone. And then finally, we need to work to increase the frequency of social contacts. So if families can help the older adult develop a schedule of activities to look forward to or ask 
various family members to schedule a weekly call or visit to their loved one. Uh, maybe you introduce technology into the home, such as Skype, um, a tap through a tablet or uh, a, a device through the television that helps them connect. There's so many options out there that can really increase the, the number of social contacts that they have throughout the, the day, week, or the month. Um, and then before we turn to the resources slide, I really do want to wrap up kind of this whole conversation uh, because we know that aging uh, has its challenges. You know, there's potential for loss of independence. Uh, there's an increased risk of isolation, but we, we still need to encourage older adults and family caregivers that there is an opportunity to age successfully. Uh, and that really, again, should be our goal when talking with older adults about these challenges that they're facing. Uh, the irony is that research has shown that those who have a more positive view of aging actually stay healthy longer. Uh, so if we can get older adults to kind of change their mindset uh, to see aging again as a positive thing, uh, we can help them stay healthy longer. So we need to celebrate age and the experience uh, that it brings, the confidence that comes with age. We need to celebrate the memories and experiences. Um, it's really uh, neat. It, that's one of my favorite things about working with older adults is talking with them about their past, looking back at all of their accomplishments and achievements. Um, it's really something to be celebrated. So many of them have done incredible things in their lives, and we want them to continue to be able to do incredible things as they age. We need to encourage them that, you know, with, with the challenges that come with aging, we can adapt. There is uh, opportunity to adapt to our situation. There's different techniques, tips. We need to embrace these challenges um, and face them head on because we can help them certainly find solutions for a lot of the issues that they're having. Um, and we need to continue, of course, to learn and grow. Um, if we can help older adults find those opportunities to practice curiosity, uh, help them set little goals for themselves, and then help them celebrate those accomplishments once each goal is reached, um, can really go a long way. And then finally, um, we need to be easy on ourselves, uh, especially older adults and family caregivers. You know, failing is something um, that's part of life. And we need not to get down on ourselves if an older adult tries something and fails um, or, you know, if, if they try a technique and it fails because, um, you know, we'll learn from those mistakes and we'll, it'll help us get better or help us find a new solution. So, again, there is an opportunity to have successful aging, uh, a successful aging experience um, as long as we're able to help these older adults and these family caregivers overcome the challenges uh, that they might be facing. So I do, I know we're running a little short on time, I apologize, uh, but I do have some resources uh, for you. Um, there's some great information for family caregivers at caregiverstress.com. I reference the area agency on aging a lot. You can type in your zip code there, find the local agency nearest you. Um, if older adults want to you know, engage in volunteering, continue to be uh, contributing to the world, they can go to that site, the National Volunteer Caregiving Network. Um, if people want to learn about loan, more about loneliness, I know I just briefly touched on it, the Campaign to End Loneliness, it's a UK-based um, campaign, but it's really neat and has some great information. And I mentioned, finally, Caption Call for the Hearing Impaired and wanted to include that free resource on there as well. So um, again, want to thank you so much for tuning in today for this important topic. And I know I, I only left about five minutes, but I'd be happy to take a couple of questions. So, Steve, I'll turn it back over to you. All right. Thanks a lot, Lakeland. Great presentation, everyone. It is time for the Q&A portion here of today's webinar. So send in those questions. Um, and let's jump right into it here. Lakeland, um, first question for you. What suggestions do you have for easing a, pair, a paid caregiver into the picture? My mother has dementia but remains significantly functional, but we're having concerns um, that are increasing as far as leaving her alone. 
Yeah, so uh, suggestions on in integrating a paid caregiver. Well, I think that that's a great option uh, in a lot of situations because that uh, caregiver can be an extra set of eyes and ears in the home. So the best thing to do, um, one is uh, I think the best referral for a home care company really is word of mouth. So you could, of course, ask around and see if anyone in your community, your circle, your social network has used a home care company that they've really enjoyed um, and then seek them out. And I think it's always great to interview several companies. And on caregiverstress.com, if you uh, do a little search for home care, uh, there is a home care solution guide on there that really walks you through some great questions to ask the various home care providers that you're looking into. Um, you know, everything from, you know, what is your training like for your caregivers to what is the background screening like, that sort of thing. And I know that you mentioned um, in the question that your, your loved one's still pretty functionally independent, but maybe is having some cognitive impairment, that caregiver can work um, to find meaningful activities that your loved one uh, can engage in. Uh, perhaps it's going together to volunteer, or maybe it's just getting out and about uh, for outings or taking them to appointments, uh, engaging them again in, in those activities that they once loved. So it's a great way to reduce that social isolation, and the caregiver can work with them to um, overcome some of those day-to-day -day challenges. They'll, and usually uh, the mantra of a caregiver is that do with, not for. Uh, so they'll help them uh, accomplish those day-to-day -day tasks um, and help them, again, to maintain their independence. So I think that's a great question, uh, and that's a great resource. Uh, but just encourage you to uh, ask the right questions, which you can find on that caregiverstress.com website, and then ask in your community for some references or uh, from from family and friends, and uh, because that's usually how you'll find the best provider in your local area. All right, uh, Lakeland, what do you do when individuals refuse care but they need it? How do you assess for capacity? That is such a challenge, and I get that question all the time. And it's so hard without knowing the details of every situation. Uh, but I think if you, um, I mentioned quite a bit throughout this presentation uh, that if we kind of take um, a proactive approach to let them know that this is a way that we are going to help you stay independent. We're going to help you stay at home. Uh, we really want you to be involved in the process. We want you to help us pick um, the right solution for you. Um, that sense of choice and control can be um, something that that older adults fear losing. So if we're able to involve them in any of the decision making, provide them that opportunity to participate, uh, and really approach it as from a proactive standpoint, um, that can be um, a, lot of, a lot of times more successful. And then in those extreme cases where you know that you've tried that, it's failed, you can always talk to the older adult about the alternatives to not having um, support in the home. Maybe it's uh, that they'll have to move, uh, that they'll have to change their situation. Um, and perhaps it's a conversation of, you know, if, if, if we can't accept the help, um, it could lead to a crisis situation, a fall, a hospitalization. And these are all things that the family is wanting to avoid. And then sometimes bringing in an outside opinion, uh, going to the physician and having the physician have the conversation, um, can be very powerful. Sometimes uh, this generation of older adults is uh, very trusting of, of their healthcare provider, or even just simply someone outside of, of um, the situation. Perhaps it's a home care company, they can come out and do an assessment of some sort, uh, or even a friend or relative who is also expressing concerns. Sometimes when you hear uh, criticisms or um, if they're fearing that they don't want to be a burden to family, sometimes hearing it from a third party that that is really needed for the the um, for keeping that person independent and in the situation uh, where they want to be, such as living at home, uh, that third party can really do wonders in helping to convince them. So those are some some tips that I hope you find helpful. All right. Uh, well, Lakeland, we have reached the end of our hour here, and unfortunately we're out of time, but I want to thank you for a great presentation and for being here today. Thank you so much. Have a great holiday season, everyone. We'll see you in the new year.